We spoke last year about uh, a lot about Russia, didn't we? We're going to talk a, lot, a bit about Russia again this year. There's a lot of concern about Russia interfering in various ways in Sweden in the run-up to the election. And last year, year we were talking about incursions in Swedish airspace or yep. close incursions, skirting the airspace. Have, have you had any more of that this year? Can you tell us what you're concerned about in terms of Russian activity in the region? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's very important because this is uh, something that has to do with domination in the long term. And um, from time to time we have had provocative flights very close to our aircrafts. We have had uh, uh, provo provo provocative flights very close to sea vessels. It has been US vessels, it has been NATO vessels. And um, the last thing that has happened in this development is that uh, they, Russia have connected to international regulations, said that they want to have uh, closed zones for two, three, four days. They have right to do that. They have said that they want to test something or they want to exercise or something. And then we close an area I I on the sea and also up in the airspace. So the result is that the civilian aircrafts have to fly another way. And... Um, this is something new, and it's a way to show some sort of domina domination. To so say that we are here, you should know that. And um, we have followed the regulations, uh, so we, we cannot do anything. We let them to do, do this, but uh, we have observed it. Ha is that, have they actually done the tests, or are they just uh, what, what they have done, I, I cannot go into that. But uh, I can say that uh, this is a new phenomenon. Yes. And... Um, when they come to you and ask for that permission, um, what sort of debates do you have about that, or do you just have to comply? No, we, 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 have, we have also only seen that this is connected to international rules and regulations. We, we cannot say anything about this if they follow the regulations and rules. And um, so they, they have the right to do it, but we notice it and we see that they, they want to do it and we see it as a new phenomenon. And was this before or after the Aurora military exercises? Uh, this was after. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they would suggest that you're provoking them by having these military exercises. Uh, when we had the military exercise Aurora, it was the biggest in 23 years with around 20,000 soldiers and it was... Uh, uh, soldiers from from the Nordic countries, from the Baltic countries, from from France, from United States. So we also exercised host nation support scenario there. Uh, there was a lot of uh, on social media and in in debate that this was something aggressive from the Swedish side. This was not aggressive. It was about defense of Sweden, and what we ex exercised was something that were directly connected to the Swedish defense decision, because what we have said in the defense decision is upgrading of national military capability connected with deeper relationship with other countries and also host nation support uh, agreement with NATO. Uh, but in Russia, they, they, would be, they would be arguing, wouldn't they, that you're provoking them by having these exercises, which aren't regular as they are in, off the South Korean coast, yeah. as it were. Um, so they're pro you're provoking them, so they're responding, you know, it's all tug of war, no one's wrong, no one's right, we're just all asserting ourselves in the region. Uh, we are not provoking anyone, we, the only thing we are doing is uh, exercise in connection with the, the, the decisions in the Swedish parliament, and uh, the only reason why we are exercises alone and together with others is to create uh, more of a higher threshold to, co to, to defend our sovereignty directly connected to international law and the UN Charter. So we, we are a peaceful nation, but we are not naive. But the way the exercise took place, it did look as if, you know, when you were talking about who that would be targeted at, who it would be in response to, everything points towards Russia. So it looks like a response to some sort of Russian... I think that this is propaganda from their side if they have this sort of feeling, because... Everybody but it moved through Norway into Sweden, didn't yeah, it, the exercise? That, that, uh, scenarios I'm not uh, ready to discuss, because then we go into another, <laughs> another dimension in my work, and th that's the secret one. <laughs> but if we say like this, the environment around us have over the years changed in a negative way, with more of military 
exercises, more of upbuilding of military capability, more of opening up of old former Soviet uh, uh, military bases. So we have another environment with more of activities in our neighbor here and uh, because of that we also must make conclusions on the Swedish side and that is upgrading our capability and deepening relationship with countries that we feel that we have a good connection to and that we share the values with and uh, that's uh, Finland we have now also planning beyond peace to non-allied nations that are planning beyond peace that's also a step but also a very clear signal around uh, how we see the situation and how we also see that we, we need to do this together to, to higher the threshold. We are closer to the Baltic states today. We have agreement with Poland. We have agreement with Germany. We have a 54 topic agreement with Great Britain. We have statement of intent with, with United States, but we also have a trilateral statement of intent. Finland, Sweden, United States. Uh, and we sign it with, with um, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Mattis in the United States in May this year, and I think that was a very important signal to, to well, the neighborhood and also to the rest of Europe. Yeah, how secure is that deal with the U.S.? Because obviously, under the Trump administration, the U.S. is looking more inward, less mm. likely to get involved mm. in battle, certainly, away from the United States, and certainly not in Europe. They would say that's a European issue. Um, tell us about the nature of the agreement. If something, if you did have some sort of worrying incursion in Sweden, what role would the United States play in that? Uh, I see all these Twitters and I see all these activities in, in, the, in the Washington and White House and so on, but in our relationship with Pentagon, and first uh, Secretary Ma uh, Ashton Carter and then uh, Mattis, I think uh, it's the same policy towards us and to, to our region. We, we, what we have seen is uh, deliverance of um, uh, U.S. participation in our exercises and a huge uh, level of interest in what's happening in our, our area and also uh, very fruitful strategical discussions. So I think that um, there is a stability. I, I cannot see anything else. If I compare with uh, compare Ashton Carter with, with Ian Mattis, I, I see the same policy, but uh, we have developed it under Mattis. So, so I think what I have seen in the relationship with uh, the Ministry of Defense and with, with the Pentagon, then we have stability. Then I also see the other side of it. And, and, uh, but I must see the realities here and what the U.S. have done. And, uh, that is okay for me and for us. But one of the realities is that Trump's going to come to Scandinavia for a meeting with President Putin. He's trying to build bridges mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are more provocations, if you like, from Russia in this region, Donald Trump's going to become less likely to take sides in that because he's trying to build those bridges with President Putin. You know, I do not want to speculate about what will happen in Helsinki. It's not up to me as now. I will see what's happening in Helsinki before I have any... Are you worried view. about those bridges being built? Uh, I, I will never talk about warriness uh, and, and that sort of things because it's better to see and uh, then comment realities than speculate because that can also be a negative part of the process. So uh, I, have, uh, I have noticed that we have this meeting in Helsinki and we shall see what will happen there. But you're not being very... Um effervescent about it. You're not very excited about it. I will it, not go into that. <laughs> <I've said> that. <laughs> but you're not giving me a negative, but you're not giving me a positive either. I, I, I can only say this, this will be a meeting in Helsinki. Yes. And we, we, I will comment it after, yes. but not before. And, and what I have seen about our agreements, our statements we have done together, they have delivered in a positive way. And I can also say that the United States have delivered military capability to, to Europe. And it's very important for the future that we have U.S. presence in uh, the Baltic states, that we have U.S. presence in Europe, because it's important for the balance, the strategic balance between Russia and Europe. And I think that that makes the threshold higher also. Yeah. And it's also very important to keep up with the sanctions towards uh, Russia connected to what's happening in Ukraine. That's very important because if, we, if th that something will be withdrawn there, then we open up for that international law and regulations and UN Charter is nothing. So we must uphold the sanctions and be very clear that the Russian behavior in Crimea is, in, in, is not acceptable. And are you united with your counterparts in Scandinavia on that? Do you discuss that? Yeah, and I think 
think uh, the most of the, uh, my partners in Europe also. Okay. Um, the nuclear weapons ban treaty, is this something you're very um, concerned about in terms of the US perspective? Because there are obviously those in Washington who don't want you to sign it, and it might affect your relationship with the countries you work with on Aurora, for example. I think that it's very important to, to have an uh, ambition to have disarmament around nuclear weapons, and uh, that's my government's positions also. Then uh, there can be different ways to do that, but uh, we have now research around this. What will, if we sign it, what sort of impact will it have on Swedish policy, Swedish situation, the cooperation with others, and how it, what sort of impact will it have on other agreements also that are connected to nuclear weapons? And um, that uh, research will be finished in October. And after that, we are ready to come back and say, what is our conclusion about it? What's your personal feeling? Yeah, I do not have any personal <laughs> feelings because I'm <laughs> representing a government. Yeah. So, so it's not up but to me. But you know the feeling in Washington about it. Uh, yeah, but uh, I have discussed also this with our American counterparts and also with others in, in Europe several times. And with uh, Mattis? Um, I cannot go into which persons I have talked to, but I have talked to, to, to people in, in all these governments about it. And um, I think that uh, I'm being very clear about now we are making this research and we will come back in October. And uh, I also explain for them what sort of things we are researching around. So we will, it will be a good job done around this. Uh, we talked a bit about, you know, concern about a military battle, as it were, but we have got going on, it seems, is a propaganda battle already, with many elections in liberal democracies, a suggestion that Russian trolls are trying to plant fake news on social media, but also cyber attacks. Is that happening here in Sweden, ahead of the election? Um, we have instructed our authorities to, to follow the all these steps and uh, there is activities on social media and also in, in other dimensions and um, we have said to them, follow all this and see if there is anything that undermines the elections in Sweden that uh, or something that are against our democracy or our election process and uh, if we find that sort of activities we are ready to expose this also for the public opinion and make it very clear that this is unacceptable behavior so, so we have instructed the authorities to do this. Then we see these um, activities with a different sort of operation uh, with the goal to make an impact on our decision-making process as a phenomenon that we have to also fight against in a deeper way. So we have said that we will now start a research about uh, to start an, an authority in Sweden for psychological defense. So we have some sort of state-controlled institution that can be very clear to the uh, public opinion about what is false, what is true in specific situations. And can, can also on a regular basis can follow what's happened with disinformation campaigns, but also be a partner on the international arena to other countries and their authorities and, and their institutions and uh, we are now also a member of STRATCOM in Riga, Strategical Communication Center in NATO. And we are also a member of Hybrid Center in, in Helsinki that they have started. So we, we take this situation seriously and we will go forward with new steps to, to be more secure and stronger. Because we see that this is a real problem and we see that others other nations and other forces want to split us in the Western world, want to undermine our democracy and want to use it for their political goals. Has there been any evidence that um, some of this, the fake news stories coming into Swedish social media and shared by Swedes has originated from Russia? No, I'm not following social media by myself on this daily basis, but... Uh, or is it just I, I will not say like this, that... We have seen on social media propaganda directly connected to something that can be useful for Russia. But you haven't tracked it back yet. Yeah, but if we say like this, when we have this um, decision in our parliament about host nation support agreement, there was a lot of rumors about that we, are for we were forced to have uh, nuclear weapons on Swedish soil. We have um, also that we will have permanent NATO troops in Sweden. Uh, this, this was fake. 
and it was spread in, in a broader, broader public, but it was also public protests against this. So there were demonstrations in the Swedish society against this. But it was wrong, all of it. It was not connected to the truth and, and not connected to the agreement that we are all ready to, to, mm. to, to sign. So this was some sort of maneuver to undermine the decision-making uh, process around this. And it was many parliamentarians that they got um, emails and letters and uh, uh, different sort of activities that they should think that this was the reality, but it was fake news, all of it. Uh, but you're saying you're getting together this research and you're looking ahead to a possible department that will tackle this, but you haven't got long, have you, before the election? The work's being done now and yeah, people's minds are being made up in terms uh, of... But it. just now, we, we have this that our authority, like uh, the security police, the, the, the authority that are, that are responsible for civilian crisis management and that sort of things and others, they have and direct instruction from the government to follow all this up during the election period. Then the question of a new institution for psychological defense, it's more a long term, but we must st start somewhere, and now we start with a research around it, so we have some sort of material to start with w w when we make the final governmental decisions. Um. It's quite fertile ground, isn't it, Swedish politics, for fake news right now? Because it's a very fractured Swedish politics. The main parties, uh, you don't have the two main parties as you did in the past. Um, is there something you feel that Swedish politics is missing, which these trolls are managing to exploit? Because they can't just put stories out there and have an impact unless they're being shared by Swedes. I think that uh, the traditional political parties in Sweden... Uh, if you see like our party, the mo my party, Social Democrats, the moderates and so on, we agree about that this is a problem. And I think we have a little bit of the same view uh, that we must uh, act against it, that we must have this the, uh, institution for psychological defense, that it's correct to give this instruction to the authorities before the election now. So I think there is in the traditional political group in Sweden, there is uh, some sort of common view about this. Th then we have seen also that uh, the right-wing extremist populism, they have used social media also for attacking uh, what we can say the, the traditional political life, but also spreading mm. fake news and rumors and uh, wrong things about uh, different sorts of things. Are you suggesting one of the other parties is spreading fake news? If you say like this, if you use social media on a broad base with pe people who sympathize with somebody to al always split the society, always talk about migration, always talk about foreign foreigners, always talk about crime connected to these groups and try to divide between Swedes and foreign people from other countries, then you split the society. You don't build something that are on a common ground that can bring the society strong in some way. Because the people we have in Sweden, even if you are born in, in another country, they are here and we have to live together in some way. And the problem we have, that we must tackle it together. So there's no solution to always have this so, so this uh, activity to split the society. And we have seen it also in the United States. And I don't think it's a good thing there. Well, you've seen it also in Germany. Yeah. You've seen it to some extent in the UK in no. all these European elections. But one of the things that I'd say as a journalist is that one of the issues there has been by the mainstream parties isolating themselves, trying to isolate the populist parties, that creates the divide which the trolls are able to capitalize on. And perhaps... You know, one suggestion is that you should be in more dialogue with the populists. The mainstream parties should be in dialogue with populists. Uh, you, you know, from, from, uh, we can take the political debate. I think that's correct. But you can never cooperate with these sort of parties. You should never give them any influence political. That must be a border there. Even though they're gaining strength and... There are yeah, people we are, who have sympathy. Yeah, they're, they're I can accept in a democracy you have a right to be racist, you have a right to be Nazi, you have a right to be communist, you have a right to be whatever you want. Yeah, but many so that's, pop, no, uh, that's not a problem. But the other but you forces... Can't, the whole of populism you can't bring in, you can't call Nazis. No, no, I haven't done that. 
I said several things, and, and right-wing populism is one thing, not this is a But that's the, that's the one that's having an impact on the mainstream parties, isn't it? Yeah, not but the, if we say it like this, fr from our party and from what I stand for, we are not ready to cooperate with right-wing populists, extremists or racists. That, that's a very clear message from us. We are not ready to that because we think that parties that have a democratical value and, and um, values based on uh, what I think is a good way to, ha to, 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 to be with people, I think that is a better value ground for cooperation, also a better ground for building good societies w with equality between people. But if you move these forces in, then you also get some of what I think in. And, and if that's not ac acceptable, if you have this border, you must have some sort of value. Everything is not acceptable. Not for me and not for the part I represent. In some other countries, um, the mainstream party have been criticised for not engaging in the immigration debate and allowing populists to own that debate. Do you think Sweden is doing better there with the mainstream parties talking we, about immigration we have, more? We have, we have done a lot. We, take, we took responsibility for 163 refugees one year, and it's a lot for Sweden. And we said that cannot be like this, that only a few countries in European Union take this sort of responsibility. We have now changed the rules and regulations, and now we have a lower level. And that was very new, necessary decisions. And now we say that the people that are allowed to stay here, after they get the permission to stay, they, we have to learn them Swedish language. And number two is to put them into jobs. So that is the key and the door to, to Im integration in the society. It's to have a job and to speak the language, and that's the two main priorities. We have a lot of work to do with this. But uh, I think that we, until now, uh, handle the situation, but we also have a lot of things to do in the future. But the solution of this, my friends, is not to say that... <laughs> Okay, they come from another country, they have a, another religion, they have a, another color of their skin, there is some other problems with maybe their parents or something, so, so we cannot have them here. Uh, that's, that will not solve it. I can assure you, it will not solve it. And when, every time you have tried that sort of methods in the history, you have been a loser with very bad consequences. And I think we can handle it here in Sweden if we have the time to continue what we are starting with now. Uh, thank you very much for speaking to me. One last question about the football. <laughs> um, what happens if Russia comes up against Sweden in the football? I don't know, but Sweden is always a winner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>